Okay. Well, in that case, let's go ahead and get started. So, uh, yesterday we'd been talking about yield criteria. So, let's go back to yield criteria. criteria. And so, in here I had given you a couple formulations now for if we have some complex state of stress, here I'm generally going to represent this as principal stresses, two and sigma three with some zeros around. So now if I have an arbitrary stress on a body, which I can always reduce to principal stresses, uh, I gave you a Tresca yield criteria, Tresca yield criteria, and I said failure will happen, failure happens if um, the max uh, the max shear stress exceeds the yield stress. And here I say the max shear stress is the principal stresses over two is greater than tau yield, or um, this is uh, my sigma y over two. So I can use either of these formulations. So I can say when the principal stresses, the difference between the principal stresses exceeds the yield stress, or when the shear stress exceeds the, the shear stress here. And the idea behind this was, so this was developed by Henri Tresca, which is a French engineer in the 18-somethings. Um, and the idea was shear is the dominant thing causing failure. Uh, I gave you another slightly more involved criteria uh, which was the von Mises criteria. <coughs> von Mises criteria, which says uh, failure happens if... Now I, I'm looking at the max distortion energy in the body. So if you remember, we subtracted out the hydrostatic part from our principal stress and we took that to be a deviatoric stress and we squared that and we came up with some long relationship. but the end result was um, that this failure happens if the yield stress, uh, I'm going to write it the same way, uh, square root of one half, I'm going to write this, sigma one minus sigma two squared plus sigma one minus sigma three squared plus sigma two minus sigma three squared is greater than or equal to my yield strength. And here now this yield strength is uh, my shear yield strength, or square root of three times my shear yield strength, sorry. Square root of three times my shear yield strength. So this yield strength is the value, in both of these cases, is the value we would get from uniaxial tension on a body, that 2%, generally that 2% offset fit. Um, or the fracture strength if you were working with a brittle material. Uh, and generally these, these two are, they, they take into consideration that hydrostatic pressure isn't deform what's deforming the body, it's, it's the shear that's actually going to cause failure, which is generally true in a ductile material. Uh, because say in a metal or a polymer or a metal, uh, you have dislocation motion or grain boundary sliding that's going to cause the deformation uh, in a polymer, it's still shear that's going to cause molecules to slide on top of each other versus tension, or hydrostatic tension in particular, which won't necessarily cause molecule motion. Yeah? So would shear force be responsible for the fracture that we see from the tension tests like yesterday? Uh, like no. It's so um, this is the interesting bit, and this is why uh, I want you to look at the failure surfaces of the materials after they've gone. So it does cause the necking. So you can think about, let's draw a picture schematic. Um, so if I have a dog bone specimen here, oh, that's a very crooked dog bone. This would not be a good engineering specimen. Um, but <laughs> so as I start to pull on this thing, what's going to happen is Basically, I'm going to start getting shear slip planes in here. And so this material is going to start narrowing out in that gauge section because of those shear planes as they start to move along in there. Do, 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 do. 
There we go. So as those shear planes start to go, that's, that's what's actually causing this necking to occur. It's, it's shearing in. And then eventually this shearing inside this gauge section, you'll start, if, I, if you zoomed in to that gauge, um, you would start getting these little cavitation pockets that started to occur because there's naturally voids and defects in the sample. And those pockets are actually going to start opening up and lead to fracture. And that fracture is going to happen in tension. So this is sort of what we'll talk about when we get into fracture theory. Uh, eighth week? Seventh week? Um, yeah. Are those shear planes determined by how the metal is cut and what orientation the unit cell is? No. It's just, this is, this is generally, for uniaxial tension, it's at a 45 degree angle. Um, ish. For, yeah, and that's because that's the direction of maximum resolved shear. So remember if we have uh, just a uniaxial tension, some sigma zero zeros everywhere, I could rotate this to a new coordinate system and say this is actually uh, what would that be? Sigma over two Sigma over two everywhere. <coughs> mm. Yeah, I think over two, sigma over two. If I were to look at this in a more circle sense, so uh, when I have uniaxial tension, I'm here on my my more stress circle, sigma tau. So. Uh, I could go to some other coordinate system over here, rotated nine, rotated 45 degrees away from this, uh, from my original direction. So my two theta is 90 degrees, or my theta is 45 degrees. And at that 45 degree angle, I'm reaching my max shear stress, which is just theta over two there. And so this is for uniaxial tension. It's generally at a 45 degree angle. Technically, you have to look at the crystal structure, um, because if you have a perfect single crystal, it's actually going to be the failure along the slip plane of the crystal that's going to cause failure, which I'm not going to talk about. Don't, don't worry about it. But we assume it's at a 45 degree angle because of that maximum resolved shear being along a 45 degree angle. Cool. Good question, though. Cool. So let's first general questions on these criteria or let's let's draw out a failure surface too for that von Mises and Tresca. So sigma one, sigma two, I'm now gonna draw this in a single slice of my principal stress space. So for that Tresca criteria, um, I have the material yields when it hits the yield strength here. Uh, or negative yield strength here, negative sigma y there. Oh, these are supposed to be parallel. That's not super parallel. Let's ignore that. So this is my, my Tresca surface, and then my von Mises surface is kind of the continuous rounded out version of that. And so these are my, oh, there we go. So these are my two failure surfaces uh, in a single slice of my principal stress space. So, questions about these before we start talking about examples? Cool. Yeah. Can you just explain like, why it's one surface? So, yeah, because actually it's a slice of a three dimensional it's a 2D slice and a 3D thing, which I'll show um, sometime toward the end of lecture, uh, an example of what it actually looks like in 3D. Okay. Yeah. So it is it is a surface in, in 3D, but because I can't draw in 3D, and or yeah, I can't do it very easily on paper, we just show it this way. Cool. Other thoughts, questions? All right, so first we'll do kind of the, the simplest example to show how this is used in practice, which is 
uniaxial tension because that's just the easiest thing to go with. Um, uniaxial tension. So I have my some body that I'm pulling with some stress sigma. I can say my stresses now are just sigma and then zeros everywhere. Uh, and then I want to figure out when that will fail based on the Tresca or the von Mises criterion. Um, so with the Tresca criteria, I say um, I'm looking for that, oh, right, technically there's an absolute value here um, because that's a positive number. <coughs> Sorry, minor correction. Uh, so here I, I'm looking for now, I can say my, my principle S1 is something, is sigma minus zero over two uh, has to be greater than or equal to my tau yield or my sigma yield over two. So this just fails fails when sigma is greater than sigma yield, which is how I'm using this, how I'm defining this to begin with. So we end up back at what we should get. For the von Mises criteria, if I plug stuff in, I have that long square root thing. Uh, so this is Tresca. Let's underline this. Uh, if I look at von Mises, I have this big square root of a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, square root of one half. This is sigma minus zero squared plus sigma minus zero squared. Uh, one half plus zero squared is equal to everything just ends up back at sigma because I have halves adding together. I have a square and then a square root. Um, and that fails when I am greater than or equal to my yield strength. Sigma yield. So I get the same result here. That's nice. That makes sense. So what I'm, what I'm essentially saying now is when I when I look now at my failure surface, in principle stress space, I'm just following this single line here. So I'm following, I'm only applying a single principle stress, sigma one. I'm following this line and I say, here at this point, both of these criteria say, failure is gonna happen when you pass that yield point there. So I'm going out in space this way along the line and at that corner, this is where failure happens. Cool. So that's a very, very simple example where you wouldn't necessarily need to use a failure surface, but this is how you can visualize it for that case. Let's look at something slightly more complicated then. So let's look now at pure shear. Example, pure shear. So now I have some body that I'm deforming or that I'm stressing with some shear strength tau or some shear stress tau. So I can say that the stress in my body is some zero tau tau zero, 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 everywhere else. If I want to look now at my two failure criteria, so I can say that the max, so I, I, I could resolve this and look and say now my principal stresses, my sigma one. So uh, we had shown this example before when we did stress rotations, um, but I can say that my principal stresses, I have some tension and some compression at a 45 degree angle. So this is at a 45 degree angle where this is tau, and that's a minus tau. Um, again, ignore the double arrow convention, just tau. This is compression, this is tension. And so I could say this could also be tau minus tau zero everywhere um, if I wanted to, or I could just say my max shear stress is tau because that's the shear stress that I'm applying. And so from my Tresca criteria, Tresca, I have 
uh, this, I guess, tau failure happens when tau is greater than tau max. Failure when tau is greater than, or tau yield, sorry, um, or sigma yield over 2. And for my von Mises criterion, von Mises, I can spell things. This is that square root now of, I'm just going to use this tau uh, from the formulation. Uh, didn't actually rewrite that one down. Uh, I'll use this one. Um, so I can say 1 half tau minus negative tau squared plus uh, this is tau minus 0 squared there's a 1 half there 1 half plus another 1 half uh, negative tau minus 0 squared if I were to plug everything back in where it was uh, and what I end up with is a 5 thirds what do I end up with the five thirds there? What I should end up with is a three tau squared. Where am I going wrong? Two, four, two, three. It is three. Yeah. So this should just be a, a square root of three tau. And that fails. When this is when this is greater than or equal to my yield strength. So now I have slightly different criteria for when failure is going to happen. So I have from the Tresca. I say when my shear is greater than or equal to sigma y over two, then failure happens. Goes to failure. Failure. And from my von Mises, I say when that is greater than or equal to sigma y over square root of 3, then that goes to here. So these are now slightly different versions of this, of this failure criteria. Fail. And so what that looks like, if we were to plot this out in principal stress space, sigma 1 sigma 2 uh, dupe, dupe going down like that is here so now my, my principal stress is tau and negative tau so I'm following a positive tau in one direction and in the sigma 1 direction and a negative tau in the sigma 2 direction so I'm actually following this dashed line out this way. And so you can see this is effectively now, when it crosses this point, this is my sigma y over 2, and this point is my sigma y over square root 3. So if I have a sigma y over 2, or if my, if my tau is sigma y over 2, I'm lying on that Tresca surface, but I'm still inside the von Mises surface. So this von Mises surface gives a little bit of leeway. It's a, it's a little bit of a wider bound for the failure than the Tresca criteria. And this is how you could envision it there. Basically, I'm, I'm applying stress along this line in principle stress space. Cool. Questions? Yeah, so, so these are different predictions for when failure would occur. Yes. Good question. So, so von Mises is generally more accurate experimentally, and Tresca would be a more conservative estimate. So, if I if I say, it, so depending on exactly what type of material it is, 
these are all approximations. These are all kind of assumptions of, of nice round bounds of things. And so uh, generally von Mises is a better predictor of when a failure will happen. But the Tresco would be a more and the more Tresco would be a more conservative estimate for it. So it it you would to get what bound you should actually follow, you would have to do some experimental measurement and see where depending on different loading states where the material would actually fail. Yeah. Um, but generally for isotropic ductile materials, von Mises is a better predictor. Do you just throw up the previous page you had? Yeah. So there's another. So so actually, so now to apply a state of pure shear is actually not necessarily trivial. Um, there's a couple tests that will actually give you a state of pure shear. Uh, one is an Iosipescu test or like a rail shear test, and that you would. Um, because it, it turns out it's it's hard to actually just take a block of material and grip it like that and apply a shear experimentally. It doesn't really work out very well. So there's a couple tests that you can do to apply shear, one of which is an Iosipescu test. This is probably the most accurate. In this one, you confine the sides of one thing, and then you apply a loading to the other side. And then in the gauge section, in this little notch section of the material, you get a state of what's close to pure shear. Um, and so this is probably the most accurate type of test to get a pure shear state. The other type of test, which is considerably easier to do, uh, because this one takes a lot of sample preparation, is a torsion test, which I'll be talking about uh, on Tuesday, maybe, a bit, um, because this will be your next lab. So in a torsion test, uh, what we assume, sort of, sort of similar to beam bending, is that at the inner surface of this material, at the, at the neutral plane, at the center of rotation of the material, uh, tau equals zero along that neutral plane, and then tau is some maximal value along the outer surface. So like in beam bending, along the neutral plane, we have no stress, and along the outer surfaces, we have the maximum stress. Here in torsion, we get a, a p effectively a state of pure shear on this surface. If you were to zoom in, you're you're essentially wrote as you shear that material, you're you're getting this sort of a shear rotation happening, uh, and you get something that's close to pure shear. But now that pure shear is happening. So so remember, depending on what our failure criteria is exactly, we either need to be looking at what that plastic yield is. So for a ductile material. I'm looking for that plane where shear is happening. So for ductile material, I would actually just be failing along the horizontal axis. But for a brittle material, which fails via a maximum normal stress criteria, I would actually be looking for what the maximum normal stresses are, which are at a 45 degree angle. So now, I'm gonna go back, what's a good piece? I'm gonna go back and get some chalk. I'm gonna play with orange chalk. So if you remember on the first or maybe second lecture, I showed a piece of chalk being bent and broken. So now this chalk is that, is that brittle material which generally fails via maximum normal stress criteria. So if I take this chalk and put it in bending, <coughs> the maximum normal stress, maximum tension stress is happening here at that top edge. So failure is gonna start there at that top edge and then propagate down and through. So I get failure happening starting at the top there and then it kind of pops through. But in torsion, so now in torsion, I'm, a, I'm actually applying a state of pure shear here. So now the direction that failure is going to start happening is going to be the direction that the maximum normal stress is. So in shear, again, I have that maximum normal stress acting at a 45 degree angle. So when I take this chalk and twist it, if I can twist it, there we go, I get that spiral cut. And so that spiral cut, you can see here, this is that 45 degree angle where shear is acting along. So now, in the context of failure surfaces, what I'm essentially doing is applying a state of pure shear. I'm looking now at what direction the shear is going to be maximal, uh, or what, what direction the tension is going to be maximal along. And then I'm saying, okay, now I'm, 
I'm going out along that direction and saying the maximum tension is going to cause it to fail there. So actually what this would look like, uh, because this is a brittle material, uh, we would be looking at that maximum normal stress. Uh, how do I want to draw this? Which is much weaker in tension than in compression. So I would be going essentially along that same horizontal dashed line, sigma 1, sigma 2. Now I say that that tension yield stress is a lot lower and failure is going to happen right there when I start crossing that torsion or that maximum tension in, the, in my sigma 1 direction. So when this value starts to exceed that sigma 1 max. And so not only is it when that when that pass when the failure surpasses that bound but it's also what direction that is going to occur in so now that torsion this is how we get this nice twisted surface it's basically at a 45 degree angle along the normal to the surface and so you'll do this sort of analysis in a little bit more depth for the torsion lab in two weeks two weeks on week six after the midterm week Cool. Fun stuff. Questions? Thoughts? Yeah. This is just a more general question. I'm not going to ask you, but this is where kind of the, the, the sigma yield, that's like a property of the material you get by testing, like a tensile test, right? And just seeing where it yields and stress rate. Right? Yeah. Okay. And so we're getting it basically because under these yielding criteria, I'm assuming there's just some point there where failure is going to happen. So to get that point, I do a uni seal tension test. So then once you know that information for any other loading, you can use like some UCs and compare that value to that signal. Yeah, exactly. Um, if it's an isotropic material. If it's anisotropic, then there's a few other criteria that I'll talk about in a little bit that you can use. But it gets a little bit more complicated. So this is just the initiation of failure. So this actually ignores anything that happens after that yield point, uh, or doesn't it doesn't account for what happens after that yield point. Okay. So after this, you could get brittle fracture, you could get hardening, you could get softening, you could get anything. This just defines if I have a complex state of stress and I have a yield strength, where is failure going to happen, or when is failure going to happen if I'm applying some arbitrary stress. Okay. And by failure, you don't mean like no, it just starts to deform, and if it's brittle, it'll fracture, and if it's ductile, it'll generally yield and harden. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's go through. Oh, dang it. Twenty minutes. Let's go through. Uh, maybe a pole everywhere first. Let me make sure this thing works. Cool. That's still there. Uh, actually, maybe I can ask you all. So, so I have a conceptual pole everywhere question, or I have another numerical example of Tresca and von Mises surfaces. What would you, do you want to see more numerical examples, or would you rather have a conceptual question to drill in some of these ideas? Numerical? Okay, cool. Let's go through another numerical example real quick then. <laughs> so, uh, in this one, let's go through another example for mix, a slightly more complicated state of stress. Mix stress. So let's say I have some body, let's actually use numbers this time. Let's say I have some body, nope. I want to apply a stress in this direction. Let's say I have some body that I'm pulling on. So I have, say, an 8 MPA in this direction, and I'm shearing it with a 3 MPA in the other direction. So this would be uh, an example of if I was pulling on a torqued cylinder. So if I, if I would, was torquing and 
pulling a cylinder, I may get this sort of a stress state. So something in tension and something in shear. So now that stress, I'm going to write out as 8330, and there's more zeros here on the outside that I'm generally going to ignore. Um, and so what I want to find is what my maximum shear, what, well first what my maximum normal stresses are, and then use that, my maximum, my principal stresses are, use that to find my maximum shear stresses, and then from there try to find um, what, whether failure is going to occur based on the different yielding criteria. So to find my principal stresses, I'm going to take that principal stress equation. This is going to be sigma x plus sigma y over 2 plus or minus that square root of sigma x minus sigma y over 2 squared plus sigma x y squared, which is kind of all crammed in there. Uh, this is also I could look at in terms of a more circle space. So here I have uh, no principal stress, or no, no stress in the two direction and some stress in the one direction. So what I'm looking for in the end is I'll have some negative uh, principal stress one and some positive principal stress two. Those two values, if I were to plug things in, this sigma one and two, I have eight uh, four, or four minus zero, or eight, eight plus zero over two, plus square root of eight minus zero over two squared, uh, eight minus zero over two squared plus three squared, which is, oh, I'm gonna try to use up all of this paper, four plus the square root of four squared plus three squared, which conveniently is five, um, plus or minus. So then I can say my principal stress is sigma 1 is 9 and my principal stress 2 is negative 1. Uh, yes, cool. So now I can use those two with some extra paper because I'm running out of room. There we go. So I can use those two and plug that into my Tresca and my von Mises criteria. So I can say from my Tresca, this is my uh, maximum shear stresses now. I'm gonna ignore the fact that technically my, so, so what I need to be considering here is I'm looking for the absolute value of sigma one minus sigma three over two, um, because I'm assuming my sigma three is my lowest here. Uh, so if I wanted to be technically correct, this would actually be my sigma 3 and my sigma 2 would be 0, but uh, I could also use the <coughs> definition that uh, I'm looking for the max of that sigma 1 minus sigma 2 over 2, sigma 1 minus sigma 3 over 2, sigma 2 minus sigma 3 over 2. And so because I'm taking my sigma 3 to be 0, here my sigma 2 is negative 1, so it's actually greater there. So then I have uh, now my tau max is that absolute value of 9 minus negative 1 over 2, which is equal to 5. Um, oh, right. Um, and then... So I need to compare this to whatever my yield strength is, sigma y over 2. Here, I forgot to say at the beginning, I'm going to assume my yield strength is something like 10 MPa, which is a minor detail. Uh, so here, under that yield strength, uh, this would be 5 MPa. So then this Tresca criteria would predict failure to occur um, under a Tresca criteria. For a von Mises criteria, uh, 
spontaneous. What I have is that square root of a whole lot of stuff. Um, I'm going to pull a square root of 2 out. 1 over square root of 2. This is 9 minus negative 1 squared plus uh, 9 minus 0 squared plus negative 1 minus 0 squared, which uh, 1 over square root of 2. This is 10 squared plus 9 squared plus 1 squared, uh, which is something less than my shear yield strength. Why am I mixing things up here? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I'm not going to plug this in because this is the square root of 182, which I can't do off the top of my head, but this is something uh, less than 10 squared, or, le sorry, less than, uh, something less than 10. Yes. Because then this is the square root of 182, which turns into 91, square root of 91, 91, which is less than 10, which means this criteria predicts survival, where this is my 10 MPA, or my sigma yield, because my von Mises stress is less than whatever my yield stress is. So now, what that looks like in my principal stress space, let's make sure that I'm plugging things in right. Yes. Uh, what this looks like is I have that Tresca criteria here going up, going up and around, von Mises criteria there. Sigma 1, Sigma 2. Now I'm following, my, my Sigma 1 is 9 and my Sigma 2 is negative 1. So I'm following effectively this kind of shallow dashed line out here. And again, my Tresca criteria, the, the yield lies on the Tresca criteria line, which is also inside that von Mises surface. So I have, from my Tresca criteri criteria, I'm predicting it to fail because it's lying on that yield surface and from a von Mises standpoint I predict it to survive because it's inside of there. So finding principal stresses, throwing those principal stresses into my appropriate Tresca or von Mises criteria and then comparing it to the yield strengths to see whether it survives. And graphically this is essentially what we're what we're saying is happening. Is something can be predicted to fail or predicted to start yielding based on one criteria and not the other. Cool. Questions on that? Yeah. Uh, it comes from actually just doing a simple shear test. So, uh, we say that, what do I want to use? Uh, so if I'm, uh, so in my, in my Tresca criteria, what I'm trying to look at is when yielding will occur. So I, I'm trying to compare my maximum shear stress to the shear yield stress. And so I, I can say in uniaxial tension, if I, uh, in uniaxial tension, I would have no other principal stresses other than that one. And so my max shear stress is just my uniaxial stress divided by two. And I'm comparing that to my yield stress. So I, I say yielding happens in uniaxial tension when I hit that yield strength. And if I compare that to my shear yield criteria, this is that criteria.
Yeah. So it comes from doing a uniaxial tension test and assuming I'm looking for my max shear stress to cause failure. Okay. Where the von Mises, I'm still looking for shear effectively to cause failure. I'm looking for distortion to, that causes failure, but I'm looking for it in, in, in the entire body. And I do that in a slightly more mathematical sense by looking at the deviatoric stress instead of just the maximum shear stress. Yeah, so it kind of, it lumps all of the shears together for von Mises. Uh, the tri Tresca criteria is relating the maximum shear in the body to a yield shear. So, did we define yield as five megapascals and then the Tresca showed that they were equal, so it's starting to fail, or did we? Yeah. So, yeah. Five megapascals I, to be signal over in, in the problem setup, I, I would have defined okay, that sorry, to be yield stress. Part. Yeah, yeah. I, I threw it in after the fact. <laughs> I know. Unceremoniously. Uh, first, thing. yeah. Uh, um, this is probably not that significant, but can you uh, quickly go over like the, the iOS rescue setup or whatever? Like, I didn't understand how that is. Oh, uh, basically, so I, so I'm trying to apply some sort of shear like this to a body, but because basically when I, when I try to grip a body like that, I'm gonna end up distorting everything else and it's hard to get it to actually be pure shear. So what I do is I, I oh, there it is, uh, is I grip a body on the sides and then I create a narrow section here in the middle. And then that narrow section, what I end up with is something that's pretty close to pure shear. Um, because here on those edges, because I'm grabbing them and moving them, I'm adding bending and I'm adding some, some extra deflection uh, that's not just shear, uh, but here in that middle section, because it's smaller and because it's isolated from the grips, then I end up with something that's close to pure shear. Okay. Yeah. How do you decide on the angle of the dotted line? Uh, this is a ratio of nine to one. So that, that vector would be nine, negative one. That's just the principal stresses that I'm applying which I didn't draw actually as a nine to one because a, a little bit, it would be a little bit shallower, but yeah. Okay, so I have, uh, uh, mm, don't have enough time to go through both of these. Let's look really quick at what that failure surface actually is in 3D. And then on Friday, I'll ask a conceptual question and do a poll everywhere based on that. Ooh. Cool. Yeah. So uh, if I were to actually look at a body now in three dimensions, what that failure surface would look like is the von Mises surface would be the cylinder on the outside, and the Tresca surface would be this hexagon in the middle. So. What I'm saying is, uh, so this would be my principal stress one, two, and three directions. What I have been showing you all is the cut section of that. So let's make a cut plane. This is solid works. Cool. So in that cut plane, this is the, the X1 and the X2 direction here. And I'm looking now at that. Here, here would be my sigma yield. I have that Tresca yield surface there and the von Mises yield surface there as that ellipse around it. Um, but what I'm essentially saying is there's, there's a cylinder now in space that is my yield surface. So actually, if I were to look along that axis, I could be applying any sort of hydrostatic pressure um, and not necessarily surpassing that yield surface because I'm saying hydrostatic pressure doesn't cause failure. Um, and then when I look at it now at at an angle projected onto that XY space or that sigma one, sigma two space, that's when I start to see this yield surface that I can draw out. Um, and so there would be, you could you would call it a, a deviatoric plane uh, normal to this, to the one, one, one direction uh, where I wouldn't see any failure. And then if I were to look along that deviatoric plane, I'd be looking for where it either passes this circle or where it passes this hexagon 
Um, and that would be where failure occurs based on these two criteria. So experimentally, um, is it possible to verify that hydrostatic pressures or hydrostatic stresses don't cause failure when you can actually kind of, I mean, not yeah. to infinity, but yeah, yeah. is there some limit? I mean, if you took like a solid block of something and dropped it to the bottom of the ocean, it would survive. So think about uh, fish, at, like deep sea creatures, yeah. which is actually the example they pull up in your book. Um, if hydrostatic pressure caused failure, nothing would be able to survive at the bottom of the ocean because it would just get turned into a mash. Um, is but there an example of hydrostatic tension not being able to cause failure? Uh, Sort of. So hydrostatic tension wouldn't cause failure, except for the fact that all materials have some cracks and flaws in them. So what actually happens is, if you have a tiny void or imperfection, hydrostatic tension will cause that to open up and then fracture to occur. So you do actually get a state of sort of pure hydrostatic tension in the notch of a crack tip. Um, so like when, when you have a crack that's opening up, in front of that crack, you get something that's close to hydrostatic tension, uh, which does cause failure because it's causing those dis those uh, flaws to nucleate and propagate. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? I think we're just about out of time. Okay. Cool. Well, I'll see you all on Friday. We'll have some wrap-up discussion for some of this and then we'll have a recitation for the beam or the, the beam